Welcome back to the webinar on government information gathering. This is Mike DeBliss. I'm so happy to have you with me on the second webinar. This webinar will cover defenses and privileges to IRS summonses. Now, before I delve into defenses and privileges, I just want to give you a thumbnail sketch on how this section has been laid out. Uh, there are three main topics within uh, defenses and privileges. The first is the Fifth Amendment privilege, the second is immunity, and the third is the attorney-client privilege and work product privilege. Now within the Fifth Amendment privilege, um, there, are two, uh, there are two main privileges. The first is the privilege as it relates to testimony, and the second is a privilege as it relates to document production. As I was um, preparing these slides, um, it was my goal to include all three, to include a discussion on all three of these topics in one um, webinar. Um, but I quickly realized that that was way too ambitious because there was simply too much information to share with you. So here's how this uh, section has been laid out. This webinar, uh, which is webinar number two, but the first webinar on defenses and privileges, will cover the Fifth Amendment privilege as it relates to testimony. The next webinar on defenses and privileges, which, is, which will be webinar number three in the entire series, will cover the Fifth Amendment privilege as it relates to document production, and then immunity. And the final um, webinar for this topic of defenses and privileges, uh, which will be number three, but number four overall, will cover the attorney-client privilege and the work product privilege. For those of you who are eagerly awaiting a discussion on Covell agreements, uh, there will be a, um, a vibrant discussion of them in the third part, uh, that being the part on attorney-client privilege and work product privilege. So without further ado, let's jump into defenses and privileges. Um, before we go deep into the Fifth Amendment privilege as it relates to testimony, let's set the stage. As you can see here in the first slide, there is this tension between the government and the taxpayer when it comes to information gathering. Very simply, the government wants information that only the taxpayer or his accountant possesses. The type of information thereafter, however, uh, could potentially be incriminating. So, if the government, and, and as you can imagine, the taxpayer isn't in such a hurry to turn over information that is potentially incriminating to the government. Because what is the government going to do when it gets that information? Well, very simply, it's going to use it to build a case against the taxpayer, um, particularly a criminal case against the taxpayer. But if the government can't get the requested documents, it can't make its case. And therein lies the tension. In most cases, uh, surrendering this information is a modern-day equivalent of an old-fashioned Western duel. So what I want you to do is close your eyes for a second, and I want you to picture this uh, old-fashioned Western duel. I want you to visualize these two cowboys that are standing outside in the middle of the street. Uh, there's probably a bar or a tavern in the background. You've got uh, one cowboy standing on the left and then another cowboy standing on the right, about 25 or 30 feet away. They both have their tall cowboy hats on. They're both staring each other down with that icy, glassy stare. They've got their revolvers wrapped around their waist. They've got their hands close to their revolver, ready to reach into that holster, pull out the gun, and fire. We're going to tweak this, this example 
slightly. One tax, one cowboy is going to be the IRS revenue agent. The other cowboy is going to be the taxpayer. Now, the taxpayer is all set for this duel. He's got his revolver on his, on his belt. It's full of ammunition. The IRS revenue agent, however, forgot his ammunition. And all he has is a, an empty gun. And he knows that he's not going to get very far with that gun. So what does he need? He needs some ammunition. And what does he do? Well, he asks the he asks the taxpayer, who is the um, uh, who is the other dueling cowboy and his adversary, to borrow some ammunition. And that is essentially what's happening here when the government asks the taxpayer or summons uh, or, uh, or issues a summons to um, get information from the taxpayer. Very simply, the information that the IRS wants could be the smoking gun. It could be the knockout punch that the government needs to successfully prosecute the taxpayer. So what type of information could potentially incriminate the taxpayer? How about business records that show that the taxpayer's actual net income is greater than the income that he reported on his return? Of course, that would uh, have a tendency to incriminate the taxpayer. Now, some of the issues that come up when it comes to defenses and privileges um, are timeliness. Um, and there are, um, there are both legal and ethical questions, but let's focus uh, first on timeliness. Let's suppose that the taxpayer has an objection to the summons. It must be asserted at the right time. Now, what is the right time? Well, we're going to talk about that now. Assuming that there is a good faith basis to challenge it, when should the privilege be asserted? We've got two choices here. The first is at the earliest stage possible so that it's preserved during the summons enforcement process. The second is at a contempt proceeding after the taxpayer defies a court order enforcing compliance of the summons and the court is considering imposing sanctions. Well, the answer probably um, is, um, is, is, very, uh, is, uh, is very easy for you to guess. But what I want to do is I want to just add a little bit of meat uh, to the bones of this skeleton example. And this is also going to serve as a refresher to the first webinar um, that we had. Let's suppose here that the taxpayer receives a summons uh, from the IRS but doesn't respond. Keep in mind that a summons is not self-executing. So the IRS has to jump through a lot of hurdles in order to enforce the summons against the taxpayer. First, it has to um, go to an attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney in the Department of Justice tax section to request um, that attorney to, to enforce a summons by going to federal court and asking the judge to do that. So that's step number one. The IRS revenue agent can't just appear in federal court on a Monday morning, go into Judge uh, Smith's courtroom and say, hey judge, um, you know, it's me, um, it's me Johnny um, from the IRS. Um, I've got this taxpayer who has blatantly disregarded a summons. I need you to enforce it. That's not how it works. Again, the uh, revenue agent has to go to a um, has to go to an assistant U.S. attorney in the Department of Justice tax section and um, ask him or her to go to court and um, and to get the judge to enforce the summons. This is what's called a summons enforcement hearing. Now the taxpayer has some due process rights. 
Um, the, pro the taxpayer has a right to go to court and to dispute the, um, the allegations that the uh, government is making for enforcing the summons. Let's suppose, however, that the taxpayer doesn't show up at that summons enforcement hearing. And so the court um, orders that the summons should be enforced. Let's suppose further that the taxpayer violates that court order by continuing not to respond to the subpoena, meaning not turning over the documents and information that the IRS wants. Now, the government can go back into court, back before Judge Smith again, and ask Judge Smith this time to impose sanctions. In that case, the taxpayer can be hauled into court for contempt. And so the question that comes up now is, during this contempt action, can the taxpayer raise a defense to the summons for the very first time? And the answer to that is no. The uh, golden rule that we have here is that objections to compliance cannot be raised for the first time in a contempt proceeding. At a contempt proceeding, we are at the next stage, which is whether um, is, which is whether there should be sanctions imposed by the court on the taxpayer for failing to comply with a court order. Keep in mind, it's a court order by, at, at, this, at this juncture. And the taxpayer, if he has not responded by providing the documents and information uh, requested by the summons, has defied that court order. So the answer to this question is very simply at the earliest stage possible so that it can be preserved. Um, if the taxpayer waits into, uh, until the contempt proceeding, it will be too late to raise any defenses to the summons. The second um, issue here is that there is an ethical um, obligation on the part of the defense attorney um, when it comes to advising a taxpayer who receives a summons. Uh, the defense attorney cannot instruct his client to disregard it um, unless there is at least a good faith basis to challenge it. And we discussed in the first webinar uh, the defenses that exist. Um, if no basis exists to challenge the summons, uh, the defense counsel cannot tell his client to ignore it. So here we see a list of uh, privileges uh, this is what I went over in the beginning of the webinar. Um, we are now focusing on the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. And the other privileges, immunity and um, attorney-client privilege and work product privilege, uh, those will be um, discussed in later webinars. Just a quick review here. Uh, tax cases uh, are document-intensive cases. As we previously discussed, if the government cannot get the requested documents, it often cannot make a case. It's for this reason that the most important issue in a document production case is whether the taxpayer has a Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to the documents that he possesses. Now, there are two main types of Fifth Amendment privileges. And um, the first one that we're going to cover is going to be the Fifth Amendment privilege as it relates to testimony. So I want to make this distinction very clear because it's oftentimes easy to blur the lines. Let's start with the um, general definition or uh, what's, what's, what's been... Um, um, what's been included as the definition of the Fifth Amendment, um, and that is that no person shall be compelled in a criminal case to be a witness against himself. That's oftentimes what comes, the, the very first thing that comes to mind when we think of the First or of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, we think about a defendant in a criminal trial, um, and we think about um, his rights 
to remain silent during that trial. In other words, he doesn't have to take the stand and he doesn't have to testify. Um, if he doesn't take the stand and he doesn't testify, he is he A, cannot tell his story, um, but B, will not be subjected to a, gru a potentially grueling cross-examination by the government prosecutor. So it's normally in this context that we um, that we're familiar with the Fifth Amendment. Um, and I should also add that at the end of a trial, the judge oftentimes instructs the jury that they are not to take the silence or not to infer from the defendant's silence that he or she is guilty of the uh, charged crime. Now, live testimony is not all that the Fifth Amendment protects. If you just think a little bit, um, if you think about it, the Fifth Amendment protects coerced confessions. And we know that from all of the crime television shows that we've seen, from Law and Order to, um, uh, to uh, uh, CSI, uh, we are familiar with the Miranda warnings and uh, we're familiar with all of the uh, movies and television shows that um, have brought that to, uh, to life on television. There's also the compelled production of business records that not many people are aware of um, is protected by the Fifth Amendment. Um, and that is, um, that is in, in certain situations, and we'll get into that um, in a later webinar. So let's uh, get right into the uh, Fifth Amendment privilege as it relates to testimony, or, um, specifically in uh, the cases of an interrogation. Um, a person in custody must, prior to interrogation, be informed of his Miranda warnings. We can probably recite these in our sleep. First, that he has the right to remain silent. Second, that anything he says can be used against him in court. Third, that he has a, the right to an attorney. And fourth, that if he cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for him. Who bears the burden of establishing that the privilege applies? Is it the taxpayer or is it the court? Well, if you answered A, you were correct. Um, it's the taxpayer that has to make at least a prima facie showing that responding to in the information request would criminally implicate him, either in this crime or in another crime. What the taxpayer can't argue and won't and what won't pass muster is, quote, if I give the government this information, I'm going to have huge civil liability. Again, the consequences have to be criminal and not civil. Uh, for those of you who are interested, um, federal, uh, federal courts attempt to balance two uh, competing interests. The first being the desire to protect the individual citizen from excessive governmental intrusion, and the second um, being the government's need to properly enforce the laws by using evidence that is obtained through, independently obtained through skillful investigation. Now, for this Fifth Amendment privilege to apply, the statements must be compelled at the time they are made. Uh, so what's interesting here is that a witness who voluntarily testifies or willingly produces documents in response to a summons uh, cannot later claim the privilege. So in other words, he can't voluntarily turn over the information that is being requested in the summons and then a week or two later say, oh, uh, you know, this, this was actually compelled um, and it was against my will. Uh, so um, I'm going to raise uh, defense to, um, to the summons. It's too late. If, if it has already been uh, provided, um, it is then too late to make that argument. Now, while we're all familiar with the Miranda warnings from television, um, there are two, um, thing, two requirements um, that, are, uh, that we may not be familiar with in the context of the Miranda warnings. Um, in order um, for the Miranda warnings to be needed, uh, or for uh, in order for the officer to actually have 
a duty to um, administer the Miranda warnings to a person, A, the person has to be in custody, and B, the person has to be subjected to questioning. Um, and, and, and this is this this is very, very important to understand because uh, not a lot of people understand these two requirements. And so we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the meaning of custody and into the meaning of questioning. But one point I'd like to raise here that is um, uh, that is quite uh, that, that is not as obvious as as it seems, uh, but if the accused hasn't been questioned, it doesn't matter whether the officer administered Miranda warnings or not. Um, as a criminal defense attorney, I oftentimes have clients tell me uh, that they were never administered their Miranda warnings at the time of their arrest. And uh, they are outraged at having not been read their Miranda warnings. Well, the next thing that I look, uh, that I ask is whether they uh, were questioned. Um, and um, sometimes they'll say, no, I was never questioned. Well, then guess what? You, it didn't matter that the police officer didn't read you your Miranda warnings. It's the, the, the whole notion of Miranda warnings is to um, safeguard uh, the accused um, against giving um, against giving an incriminating statement um, after being questioned. Um, and so if the accused has not been questioned, um, then, it, uh, then it doesn't matter that the Miranda warnings weren't issued. And we're going to get into what's meant by questioning um, in a little while. So these are legal terms of art. Um, and, and what are the consequences for failing to administer Miranda warnings? Well, let's suppose that uh, we have these requirements, that they, they've been satisfied, that a person was in custody um, and he was subjected to questioning, but the officer never administered the Miranda warnings. And let's also add the following fact, that the accused gave a statement that was downright incriminating, meaning I did it. Well, under those circumstances, the, that incriminating statement would not be admissible at trial. In other words, a jury would never know that the defendant uttered a word to the special agent or the detective, much less that it was incriminating. Why? Because the detectives didn't read the accused as Miranda warnings. As I said, we're going to um, delve a little bit deeper now into uh, the meaning of custody and questioning. Um, so what does custody mean? I'm sure that when uh, we think of custody, um, we might automatically think that a person has to be in handcuffs in order to be in custody, or that a person has to be in a police station. Well, that's not necessarily true. The standard is a reasonable person standard. And it's, it asks this question, would a reasonable person in the defendant's position feel as though he were free to leave? Now, what's reasonable depends on all of the circumstances. As we discussed, um, a person doesn't have to be in handcuffs in order to be in custody. A person doesn't have to be at a police station in order to be in custody. Um, the example um, that really drives home this whole concept of custody is one where the accused is in his own home um, and detectives have arrived, um, awakened him up in the middle of the night out of a sound sleep. Uh, there is a uh, visible presence of officers. There's four officers surrounding his bed and they begin questioning him immediately. Well, the uh, question, that was the exact issue that came up in a Supreme Court case, the case of or Orozco versus Texas. In that case, the court was called upon to um, answer, to, to uh, determine whether a person in those circumstances was in custody. And the court held that he sure in hell was. 
um, he was um, he was he was in custody because a reasonable person in the defendant's position would not have felt free to leave. So what that case stands for is a proposition that a person in his own house can be in custody. How about questioning? Let's delve a little bit deeper into what is meant by questioning. There's two types, express questioning or the functional equivalent of express questioning. When we talk about express questioning, um, the best the, the easiest way to uh, think of express questioning is the detective saying, uh, "Were you um, uh, uh, were you uh, at the at the uh, crime scene on uh, the night of December fifteenth at uh, five o'clock? Did you uh, shoot the victim?" That is the clearest example of express questioning. But sometimes it's a little bit vague as to whether the um, person is being questioned. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the detective may not necessarily be asking direct questions, but they might, by their words, by their words, be suggesting, a, by their words, trying to elicit an incriminating response from the accused. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at a case that came up a while ago, and it's known as a Christian burial speech case. It is a very interesting case. I won't bore you with all of the details, but I do want to uh, talk a little bit about it so that you understand what is meant by the functional equivalent of express questioning, because this does come up frequently in tax cases when uh, special agents are um, are talking to um, targets. In this case, um, there was um, there was a child who um, was missing for a number of days. Um, this took place um, in the Midwest. Um, the detectives. Uh, didn't have any leads for some time, um, but then they then they um, then they then they uh, came upon a person uh, uh, who uh, was a suspect in the case, and they rounded him up. Uh, they rounded him up in an area that was um, quite a distance away from the police precinct, and this detective, um, uh, this detective. Uh, sat the um, suspect in the car and uh, began driving him to the police station uh, for what was probably later going to be questioning. Now, during the course of the ride to the police station, the detective uh, did not administer any um, Miranda warnings. However, he did um, embark on this wide-ranging conversation covering a variety of topics. Um, one of which was religion. Um, it was during, it was when he um, launched into this um, conversation about religion that this whole uh, Christian burial speech um, came to be. And what the detective um, said to the uh, suspect as they were driving was this. I mean, I'm going to um, I'm going to paraphrase, but he said to the effect, I want to give you something to think about while we're traveling down the road. Number one, I want you to observe the weather. It's raining, it's uh, sleeting, it's freezing, driving is treacherous. It's going to be dark early this evening. They're pre even predicting some snow for tonight. And I feel that you yourself are the only one that knows where this little girl's body is, that you yourself had to have been there at least once. And if you get a snow on top of it, you yourself may be unable to find it. And since we will be going right past this area on the way to Des Moines, I feel that we could stop and locate the body so that the parents of this little girl might be entitled to a Christian burial. After all, 
This little girl was snatched away from them on Christmas Eve and murdered. And I feel we should stop and locate it on the way uh, on the way into Des Moines rather than waiting until the morning and trying to come back out after a snowstorm and possibly not even being able to find it at all. Well, as the car continued towards Des Moines, um, I'm sure you can guess what happened. Uh, the defendant, um, who was um, merely a suspect at that time, uh, confessed that he would show the officers where the body was, and he directed the um, detective right to the body of the child. Uh, so even though in that case the detective did not blatantly ask the uh, suspect a question, it was simply um, the, uh, the facts that he um, was talking about that um, were viewed as um, as as um, as eliciting an incriminating response from the suspect, and so that was viewed as questioning. And because the accused hadn't been issued his Miranda warnings before um, he confessed, his statement was thrown out, meaning it was um, it was never heard by a jury in. The case. <clears throat> so how do criminal investigations um, usually begin in the tax world? Well, as um, unusual as it may sound, uh, they usually, um, these uh, criminal investigations usually begin by a pair of special agents appearing um, on the taxpayer's doorstep or at his place of business. And the conversation usually goes something like this. Uh, we're special agents from the IRS. We'd like to talk to you. So in a circumstance like this, is, uh, is the taxpayer in custody? No. This is a non-custodial situation because the taxpayer has not been arrested and is free to terminate the encounter and send the special agents home uh, packing. So the full Miranda warnings aren't required in this situation. Now, despite these shock tactics, the IRS wants to obtain admissible evidence. The Internal Revenue Manual includes rules that apply to in conducting non-custodial interviews. And uh, there are a few here that I list. Uh, the first is that special agents must identify themselves um, and display their badges. The second is that when an individual is a target of an investigation, the special agent must advise him of his constitutional rights during non-custodial interviews. The third is that the special agent must not use any type of nefarious um, means to uh, obtain evidence or information. And the fourth is that the special agent must always inform the subject of his constitutional rights at the beginning of a formal question and answer interview. So that begs the question, what happens if the agent fails to follow the rules set out in the Internal Revenue Manual? And we have two choices, A, absolutely nothing, or B, evidence is suppressed. Now, the answer to this might be counterintuitive to what you, uh, what you initially guessed. And we're going to explain. We're going to explain why. But this is um, this is known as the Ciceras doctrine after a special case. And what it says is that a special agent's violation of the internal rules of an agency, such as the IRS, doesn't result in suppression of evidence unless the violation rises to the level of constitutional magnitude. And I'll repeat that again. A special agent's violation of the Internal Revenue Manual rules does not result in suppression of evidence unless the violation rises to the level of constitutional magnitude. I know it is a mouthful. So why? Why is that? Well, um, the reasoning of the court um, is this. First, 
the court says that the Internal Revenue Manual is um, a manual that's issued to government employees for the purpose of guiding them. Um, they don't establish rights in the taxpayers. In other words, taxpayers are not intended third-party beneficiaries of these documents or rules. Second, the court was concerned about policy considerations. And the rhetorical question that they asked was, what would happen if government agents were scrupulously held to these policies? Well, think about it. In some cases, violations of the policies would result in the guilty walking. And how would the government react to that? Well, of course, the government doesn't want the guilty to go free. So the theory is that the agencies would stop issuing rules just based on the, um, just based on the possibility that a, um, you know, a guilty person would go free, uh, that would, um, that would cause the agencies to stop issuing the rules. And the reason for that is that if no rules are issued, no rules can be broken. Therefore, um, you know, someone wouldn't be able to get off scot-free under this, um, under an excuse or uh, through a loophole. And the court, uh, again, on that whole idea of policy making, said that it was more desirable that agencies, including the IRS, issue detailed rules, which may occasionally be violated, rather um, than the court create a uh, disincentive that would shill the issuance of the rules. So again, all of that goes to uh, the court um, saying that uh, saying that the policies in the Internal Revenue Manual have no teeth, essentially, and that they can be violated um, and violated with impunity, uh, for that matter. Uh, without there being any repercussions, um, unless they rise to the level of some type of constitutional violation. This is a preview of what's to come in the second webinar. Um, this deals with the privilege and document production. During the government's information gathering stage, uh, there are Fifth Amendment concerns that come up when the taxpayer is asked to produce records or other documents. We're going to delve into that in the next webinar. Uh, we will also cover in the next webinar immunity. And we'll round out the um, discussion of defenses and privileges with a um, discussion on the attorney-client privilege and the work product privilege. And I promise there will be um, a uh, a robust discussion on Covell agreements uh, since that affects a lot of uh, viewers of this uh, webinar. If you have any questions um, at any time, please feel free to contact me uh, directly. Uh, this is my these are my um, this is my contact information, um, my telephone number and my email. Uh, feel free to drop me a line. It was a pleasure having you here in the second webinar and stay tuned for our third webinar in the series in this series.